Hey Joe, this week I want to talk to you about my grading policy. This week is the last week of school, so our end of the year grades are due for my students. So I thought this would be the perfect opportunity to talk about how I grade my student work. So I want to talk to you a little bit about how I feel about grading. I'll give you some of the categories I use when I grade student work and then finally go through an actual example of a unit that I taught this year. And before I get started, I know a lot of people are really uncomfortable talking about their grading policy. It's almost like taboo to talk about it, uh, where it's like super personal, which is kind of weird. Or I don't know if people are scared to talk about it because they haven't really thought about their grading policy. They just go with what's easy. They are guilty because they don't think they're doing a good job, so they don't want to draw attention to it or maybe they're just doing what their college professor did or what their high school teacher did. But I kind of want to buck that trend and just kind of put my policy out there so that people can see it so it's not something secretive or a mystery about how grading works in my classroom uh, and just try to be as open as I can with it. That being said, uh, I would love to hear any feedback you guys have about things that work for you or ways to make my policies better. I would love to see those things in the comments. First, I want to talk to you about how I feel about grades. I want to make it super clear that I think that grades are pretty stupid. I think they do a lot of harm to student learning. Some of the bad things about grades is I think students can get so caught up with all they care about is the grade that they get that they lose a lot of the excitement for actually the learning process. And I think the parents can be just as bad where they look at a student grade and if it's a good grade, they'll assume everything with that student is going great. On the other side of the coin, maybe students are doing great with developing skills they'll need later in life and are working well, but maybe this content just isn't something that they're good at or maybe they really struggle with taking tests and so the grade aren't where uh, maybe their parents hope they would be and then they really get on their kid when their kid is doing everything that I'm asking them to do. But on the good side, I do take pride in thinking that the grades I take in my class do a good job of showing how well students are learning the content and it is a good indicator about whether they have mastered the standards that I'm teaching. There are a few things that I do to try to make sure that that happens. One of those is with my late policy and with my test policy. Um, students can turn in missing assignments anytime and earn full credit for it because I don't want to take points away from students um, because now all of a sudden I'm no longer grading how, low, how well they understand the biology. Now I'm grading how well they're listening or how well they can follow directions, which isn't what I want my grades to reflect. And then with my test policy, uh, anytime a student fails a test, they can retake it, turn up to a 70%. The reason why I do it that way is I think 70% shows that they've met um, my expectations for learning the standard. One thing I don't want students to do is just say, well, I'm not going to prepare for the first test. I'll just take it and failing it, knowing that I can retake it. I understand if somebody has like something going on where maybe they like ended a relationship or got in a fight with their parents or something outside of school is going on so they couldn't learn the content. I don't want that one bad week to ruin their whole semester, but it is still gonna hurt enough that hopefully they're motivated to always prepare for their tests. Another thing that you can do with grading is I think it is possible to take grades, but not make the emphasis on grades and to still make it about the learning process. The goal of my class is not for them to be able to get a certain grade, it's for them to develop skills, to embrace the learning, to learn for the sake of learning um, and to develop as a person. There are tons of things we do in class that are all about learning and that I don't even take grades for. Uh, if we're doing a hands-on activity or a demo or a lab, I don't want my students so focused on doing it right that they aren't willing to make mistakes and to learn from them. That way they're free to actually learn the material without worrying about the grades. So I put my grading into five main categories. The first category is videos that my students made. I mentioned these back in my previous video. So those are things that we do in class where they do lots of group work, peer teaching. The main reason why I grade it is just as a way to reward students for the work they've done. We also do activities in class. These are things that are like done in class, kind of more hands-on uh, or with their iPads or giving presentations to the class. Then we have the assignment and the assignments are uh, just a chance for students to practice some of the skills they'll need to show they've mastered the content before they take their test. The last part is the test. For my tests, I always try to make it so that all the other categories added up, add up to approximately the same amount of the test. So about half of their overall grade is gonna be how well they do on the test. All the other work is just building up to developing that mastery, and then they can show that mastery on the test. The last category is the final. 
So I give a midterm final and a final. Our school district has a policy where that has to be worth 10% of their grade, which I think is probably too much. For the end of the year, they take their only multiple test of the year. That way I can get it graded and back to them before they leave. And it is a cumulative final for that, not over the whole semester, but just from the midterm on. So it just emphasizes the importance of learning where it's not about memorizing this to pass the test. It's all about learning things in a way that you can remember so that a cumulative test really isn't that scary. So going through a quick example, I'll use my gene expression unit as the example for this. I have three videos for this one. We've got our replication video, our transcription video, and our translation video. Um, each of those five points, so that's 15 points total. We got two different activities. One, we make uh, DNA models using marshmallows, Twizzlers, toothpicks, and gummy bears. They take a picture of it on their iPad and then use like ThingLink to highlight like the five main concepts for DNA structure. And then another activity we do is with replication where they cut out DNA strands and manipulate the DNA strands. That's five points and eight points. Then there are assignments. Uh, I got two different assignments. The first one is over like the first half of the unit where we're talking about DNA structure and replication. The second assignment is over more of the transcription and translation gene expression concepts. Um, so again, they get a practice using a code on table before they have to do it on the test. And that's 10 points and 13 points there. Um, so all of those added together is 59 points. And then the last thing for that unit is the genetics test. And that's worth 44 points. So it is the biggest chunk by quite a bit. The highlight of the week is pretty easy for me to think of. I had two students come in uh, and have conversations with me that just really made me feel super great. First one was a special ed student who came in and it's really hard to kind of tell how he's doing in class, but he has been working hard. He has been getting all his work turned in and doing well. He came in, he's like, Mr. Tim, um, I'm gonna really miss uh, coming to biology next year. I didn't think I was gonna like this class, but you really made it fun with all the activities that you do and I really like learning from you. I think you're a great teacher. The other one was my teacher aide who was a senior. Her last day of school, she came in the morning and she's like, Mr. Tim, this is gonna be super awkward, but I wanna say it anyway. I just think you're a really good teacher and that you are so much better than you were when I had you as a sophomore. And I'm thinking, well, is this an insult or a compliment? Because you said I'm a good teacher, but you just said I used to be a crappy teacher. So I'm just like, well, I'll just smile and go with it. And she's like, uh, your sophomores don't appreciate you for all the work that you do to make learning fun. And it's great to see teachers who uh, really work to become better at being teachers. They're just not mature enough to understand that yet, but I think you're a great teacher. And that really meant a lot to me. So those two uh, are things that I'm gonna really treasure. Um, and that's what makes teaching the best profession that you can have is having impacts on students like that. My struggle of the week, student behavior. These last few weeks, it's always kind of tough to keep students focused and motivated on learning. Last Wednesday was our last uh, day of school for seniors. And so when they leave, it kind of changes the atmosphere of the whole school. And students are like, well, the seniors aren't here, so I don't really need to be here. Or don't really need to be focused on learning. And I always tell my students, don't play this game where you see how much you can cause your grade to go down in the last two weeks of school. Last, I want to talk about activity. Uh, activity I did was a evolution game that I think really helps students learning with concepts that they're kind of struggling with. I didn't have a chance to do a lot of activities, so I kind of fell into the uh, rut again where I'm just kind of lecturing to the class and students are writing words on paper, but they're not making connection and so they're not actually learning it. And I could really tell from like some of the review stuff that we had done over the content. So I knew they were really struggling, so I decided to make a game so the game I came up with is I had three main categories. There were four factors that we talked about before Darwin. Then we had five of Darwin's main ideas and then five pieces of evidence for evolution. They had to race the other group to get all of their note cards put into the correct category. I gave them 10 minutes to practice that. And I also told them I'd be asking them questions. Um, so they were kind of quizzing each other as they were doing it and saying, okay, why is this important? What was the main idea behind this concept? They really enjoyed it. I put a clip up on uh, Instagram and Twitter of them doing it and they, I didn't realize how much fun they were having until I went back and watched the clip and saw how engaged they were. And I do think it really helped their learning. The first game, it took them like 45 seconds to get them in the right order um, and they missed some of the questions I had about the content. But then by the third game, I think the record was 13 seconds, but they were all like under 20 seconds and they were doing a lot better job answering the questions. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Educating Joe. Feel free to like, share, comment, or subscribe. And to all you other Educating Joes out there, have a great week teaching.